I'm going way back to when I was uh, just five years old in the 1940, and I lived in this apartment building here up on the second floor. And uh, I used to look out the window all the time out across the area, and lo and behold, I got to see UFOs. I'm not sure my parents believed that I saw UFOs, but I saw them regularly. Actually, what I would see would be all these birds, and these birds would congregate together, and thousands of them, and they would um, land in this field here. I don't know if you can see this uh, park. And right about this area they would land, and this is my home here, look across into the field and see it land. And when it landed, the uh, starlings would go down and they would make this craft. <laughs> and I saw this many times. And uh, I was in kindergarten and I would go and, you know, they have uh, tell what you've seen. At, and I would tell them about seeing the spaceships. And all the kids really thought that was great. And they used to ask me to speak every day about my experiences and seeing what the, <laughs> the, the aliens were doing. <clears throat> uh, after we moved away, I joined the... Uh, the Air Force and learned to fly through flew T-33s and uh, along the way I met a German scientist which is kind of strange in a way but um, it happened that a good friend of mine happened to be German and his father had come from Germany and we took a trip to Florida together and he met this scientist and this scientist claimed that he had seen a UFO as a matter of fact, four of the scientists were at uh, White Sands Proving Ground and they were walking up a ridge and just as they got to the top of the ridge and just their heads came over the top of the ridge, they saw this UFO down in this valley. And there's five little aliens that were picking up rocks. Now it sounds funny, but I didn't particularly believe the story at the time. But we were with this uh, German scientist for two weeks, and he kept on repeating the story. And he told that he went back to headquarters, and the five the scientists told the White Sands colonel that they'd seen this UFO, and he said, "No, you didn't. Uh, you just forget about it." So that was one of the first experiences that I had. I went to James Connolly Air Force Base for navigation training, and uh, here I am in front of an aircraft. And while I was there, I was asked to be a courier and take secret classified messages over to um, 12th Air Force headquarters from James Connolly Air Force Base. And when I arrived there, there was an officer there that I gave the uh, classified messages to. And I said, what do you do, uh, sir? And he says, oh, my job is to uh, schedule UFOs into Gray Army Air Force Base. And they pick up cargo and so on and take them away. And I didn't think to ask him whether it was our UFOs or alien UFOs, but uh, very early I heard that there was UFOs in the Air Force. And they were at Gray Air Force, Army Air Force Base. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, there's some secret hangars there, at least I was told that, and that these craft would land and be moved into the hangars. And at the same time, large amounts of uh, cargo would come in on trucks. And the strange thing is that these trucks would come on and they would, uh, not come out of the base. People would see, you know, hundreds of trucks go on the base and nothing come out. I'm not sure what that meant, but it was kind of strange. James Connolly allegedly had uh, disc 
flying out of it. That was the word that we were told. I did not see any disc. This happens to be uh, Michael Schratz's uh, pictures of discs that were at uh, James Conley or, and other bases. When I graduated from uh, flight, transferred to Athens, Greece. And uh, here we're going into Athens and seeing the Acropolis and the Parthenon. And the fellow that was in the office next to me was a pilot who had come from Korea. And he flew B-25s over Korea. And he said he was flying there one day on a bombing mission. And flying off his right wing is a UFO. And this UFO stayed with him for an extended period of time and started doing loops around the aircraft. <laughs> And then it flew off in high speed. Now, again, I didn't see that, but I believe what these people are telling me because it's first-hand accounts. Then I was transferred to London, England, and there I flew um, tanker aircraft. My mouth is dry. <laughs> and in the tankers, we were up every night, and the idea was that when the weather got bad, the fighters had very short time airborne, only an hour or so, and they would need to be refueled when the fog rolled in in England, and they would go off to uh, Spain or Germany. Well, we were up there with 16 hours of fuel, and we were told that uh, they had had bad occurrences when the uh, RAF fighters went after the uh, UFOs and that some of them didn't come back and they asked us if we would chase the UFOs instead. <laughs> sure I wanted to do but uh, you know what the heck. And they said that, un un that they didn't bother unarmed aircraft which we were not armed. It was just the uh, fighters that tried to fire at them and they get mad at it. Well, in any case, uh, we're up there one night, uh, just as the sun's coming down, and London Control spotted a UFO over the center part of England. And we're flying up here. Oop. Over the uh, North Sea, and the UFO is down here near Stonehenge in the center of England. So we, we're at some 33,000 feet and the UFO is at about a thousand feet so we had to move from uh, the North Sea down to where they were which would take um, oh, 20 minutes or so but we were doing some 400 miles an hour and we're diving down and we look <clears throat> over at the red line of the aircraft we're going 30 miles over the speed limit so to speak on the aircraft the red line means if you fly above that speed your wings will come off which is a bad thing. <laughs> so, so, so anyhow, we had to pull back on the power. But we look on the radar, and interestingly enough, on the radar is this huge radar return. And uh, if you fly over Scotland, one of the most prominent radar returns is the Firth of Forth Bridge, which is shown here. And the radar return was just like the Firth of Forth Bridge. Assuming that they're the same type of object, the Firth of Forth Bridge is uh, almost 100 years old and it's made out of uh, old iron and steel, but it's roughly this shape, and that's uh, the same shape that the UFO had. And when we got near Stonehenge, England, by that time we had slowed down some, it's out in front of us, and it was actually at night, but this is what it looked like. It looked like a long cylinder shape object. If the radar was correct, it was almost a mile long. It was a huge object just hovering over the center of England. When we got close to it, about a mile or so away, it just went up into space. We were doing about 400 miles an hour. I would say that it probably did 400,000 miles an hour going up. In any case, we couldn't catch it. <laughs> and this is what it looked like in space. This is him item that um, would indicate 
that there was interest by the London Royal family that we got an invitation to the officers club and the uh, speaker was uh, Prince Philip and when he was during his speech he asked that he could speak to the air crews that had chased the UFOs over England and we didn't know how he knew but I guess from the London control people had told him so in any case we sat down with um, Prince Philip we had a nice conversation and dessert <clears throat> and everybody smoking cigars in those days <clears throat> any case I told him just the story that I had just told you and uh, a couple of the other fellows had their stories and I asked Prince Philip why he was interested in UFOs and he said that his uncle the Earl Lord Monbatten had seen the UFOs up close so from that day on I believe completely in the validity of UFOs existing because I heard it from the Prince <laughs> Besides that, I've seen them on many occasions. So, uh, but it, it, how many here have seen UFOs? Have you ever wondered if you really saw it? I mean, you know, <laughs> I, you always have that feeling, did I really see this object from another world? It's, it's hard to understand. Well, here's a picture of UFOs over England at an air show. They show up at the air shows on a regular basis. I was then transferred from England to um, Hampton, Virginia, which is shown here, and to the headquarters at um, Tactical Air Command at Langley, Virginia. And I was there only a few days when the Cuban Missile Crisis broke out. And I don't know if you remember this back in 1962. Some of you obviously are younger than that. But the Soviets had built missiles and put them in the... Uh, in Cuba and were ready to fire them at the United States and being that I had been in Europe I had gained a top secret clearance and I was one of the few people on base that had the top secret clearance that they could make a courier so I had flown a couple missions down near Cuba and they pulled me out of the flying jobs and we had started building up our forces all kinds of fighters and bombers went into southern United States so that we could fight the Cuba and the Soviets in Cuba if we needed to well in any case my job was to go from tactical air command headquarters from General Sweeney to General LeMay and I would make this trip sometimes twice a day and I would be carrying uh, top secret material that would indicate what was happening and how, how much the um, Soviets were building their missiles and this kind of thing. And one day General LeMay said to me, tell Sweeney if they shoot down one of our reconnaissance aircraft, we're going to go in and bomb them. And I said, yes, sir. I went back and told Sweeney what General LeMay had said. So our forces were ready to go in and bomb Cuba on a moment's notice if we lost a plane and lo and behold we did <laughs> but at the last moment President Kennedy probably smarter than some of us uh, decided not to uh, let us go in there a Soviet S-75 had shot them down one interesting thing is that part of the information that we were getting was that there was U-2s besides U-2s there was UFOs over Cuba and that they were seen uh, apparently finding out what the Soviets were doing we have found that wherever there's nuclear missiles the U-2s or the um, UFOs show up I back at Langley after the uh, missile crisis died down I one of my friends was an F-106 pilot and he told me the story that F-106's had been shot down by a UFO in Japan and uh, this is what the F-106 looks like at the time it was our fastest aircraft and uh, it, they had taken two of them 
and uh, taken them to uh, Misawa, Japan, and over the J Sea of Japan, the UFO was tracked one day and they launched a couple of fighters. One fighter had problems and came back immediately, and the uh, second one at went after the UFO. Now, he w happened to be in the command post and he could listen to the operation going on and that the F-106 pilot was closing in on the UFO and fired its um, missiles at the UFO and they went directly towards it, the UFO and it looked like it hit it and he explained, I've got it, it's, it's, it's blown up and when the smoke and everything cleared, the UFO was still there. There was some kind of a shield that the UFO had that kept it from being uh, destroyed. Then the UFO started coming towards him and he said, the UFO is coming towards me and it has some kind of a beam. I can see the beam. And with that, the radio went dead. Uh, talking among the pilots, we found that um, we had lost quite a few aircraft in attempting to um, knock down the UFOs. This is a drawing of what something what it looked like. It was confirmed as a disc shape. They sent out aircraft to find the uh, pilot. They never found any evidence that ever existed. And it had been uh, obviously blown up or absorbed by the um, UFO. Now, at Langley Air Force Base, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Langley was the home of where the Apollo mission started from. And uh, they had built, sounds funny, but they built like a section of the moon and had these great big cranes and the astronauts were uh, kind of flew objects to get the idea of what it's like to land on, on the moon. And as I would go through, I would meet different people and so on, and it was kind of an open secret, but they had claimed that they had found um, alien bases on the moon. And these are some pictures that I've been able to gather up, which indicates that there is some kind of structures on the moon. And uh, I think that, in fact, is the case, that uh, aliens are there. We have indications that they're doing mining there and probably use that as a base to uh, come here. Triangle-shaped object here and uh, possible other object up on this point. And this slide is rather interesting in that uh, this is one of the early slides taken before our astronauts actually got there, but they indicate some kind of a, a base or, or a UFO of some kind. Now, <laughs> when you're in tactical air command, you're also part of the Navy. That sounds funny, but um, we're the Air Force part of the Atlantic Fleet, and consequently, I, periodically would have to go over to Norfolk, Virginia and work for Admiral Moore, who eventually gave me a letter of accommodation. But one day we're playing an exercise in the command post and there's like 50 people in the command post and they say everybody out of the command post except for the media presenter and the uh, commander of the command post, who was a captain. And with that, everybody leaves, and Admiral Moore comes in. So there's only three people in the command post that normally have 50 people. And after about uh, an hour or so, he came back out and he left. We went back in, and I said to the media guy that I knew pretty well because I brief periodically with him, you know, what was going on. And he said that they had uh, reports of a UFO over uh, the Atlantic Ocean and that the carriers were launching aircraft to pick them up. 
and they thought that the UFO had come out of the ocean and was flying, you know, over the Atlantic, and they were trying to pick it up. Well, they launched fighters to um, find the UFO and get uh, gun camera film of it, and uh, some F-4s were launched. And according to him, they had sent the gun camera film to the command post, which he he had shown to Admiral Moore. He said the interesting thing about it is when Admiral Moore came in the command post, he said, is this a Russian operation with us or are we doing this alone? And this is 1966. And they said, no, it was uh, just our own. And we had uh, been chasing them. Again, we didn't really catch them, but we got some good uh, video of it. In 1968, I was sent to Vietnam, and um, again, my job was a, a briefer there in intelligence at 7th Air Force headquarters. And I worked for um, General Brown, who has his biography, and in the biography, he says, they weren't called UFOs, they were called enemy helicopters. They were seen up around the DMZ in the early summer of 1968. Well, I had briefed him about them, and I don't remember calling them helicopters, but um, I think we just called them unidentified aircraft. But UFOs were seen on a fairly regular basis in Vietnam. Uh, they seemed to come and enjoy watching the war, so to speak. <laughs> you know, we're kind of, a lot of us don't think about it, but we're, you know, kind of warlike. We uh, seem to be in war all the time. There's a couple going on right now, you know. <laughs> Any case, uh, this photograph happened to be given to me by a, a Navy commander, uh, Bethune, but it's a rather interesting picture that he, he had gotten close up. After a year in Vietnam, I came back to uh, Scott Air Force Base, and uh, which is in Illinois. And again, I was a briefer, and I briefed on a regular basis in intelligence every morning, which is not the greatest thing. You have to come in early in the morning, like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, and prepare your briefing for the, generally at 8 o'clock. And uh, you go in the command post, and they have uh, four or five sl slides. We only have two here, but there you have uh, five, and, you, and they like you to keep the screens filled with... Uh, with slides. So <clears throat> I went down to the Washington DC and the Pentagon and there's a, a section off the Pentagon where they have literally a room this big full of slides and pictures and movies and, and everything you could ever want for video. <clears throat> well, in any case, I went in there and I got about a thousand slides and many of these are, you know, secret and top secret slides you know, of Soviet aircraft, there's SAM missiles and uh, things that they, again, they don't let the public see. But I mentioned to the fellow behind the counter after I got like a thousand slides, I said, you know, about once a month I brief uh, a UFO sighting pretty much like um, I'm doing now. <laughs> In any case, uh, I need some pictures of UFOs. The fellow says, we got a whole vault full of UFO pictures and gun camera film, but you can't have them. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I'm the general's briefer. General Canton sent me to get slides and so on, and you just gave me a thousand slides, many of which were top secret and stuff. He said, you can't have any. <laughs> he said, they're in a vault. The vault is guarded, and you need written authorization from a four-star general unified commander with a need to know to get those pictures of UFOs. This is the highest classified data in the Air Force. Now one interesting thing is no one ever said UFOs didn't exist. No one ever said that, uh, you know, they weren't there. This is myself and my wife, just to prove that I was in the Air Force. <laughs> also the fact that I'm married to a very beautiful lady. And uh, from Scott Air Force Base, 
I was sent to Thomas McGuire Air Force Base. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, one of the things that we're briefing about one morning was the uh, 1976 UFO over Tehran, Iran. Most of you have heard about that, but the fact that uh, it's been released. And, but at the time that I briefed it, I think it was a secret message coming in that uh, these uh, UFOs were, this one large UFO was there and it was uh, very intense, alternating lights, and that many, even hundreds of people could see it from Tehran. And the public calling the Iranian Air Force got them to launch some fighters, the F-4 fighters. And uh, Two fighters were launched, and a Lieutenant Perazzi was the, uh, in one of them, and he, he was ahead of the other aircraft, and he, when he got closer to him, he said it looked something like this. It was um, blue lights on the outside, more or less a cylinder with red lights going around the side. This is his drawing, by the way, of what he saw the UFO looked like. And uh, he, he was thinking in terms of uh, getting closer in, possibly to fire on it, and in any case, some kind of electromagnetic interference effect his, his aircraft, his instrumentation went out, and he turned back for the base. The second jet came in, and he could see that this, there was a smaller object being detached from the large UFO, and he got closer. And this is a depiction of what it looked like, which actually was made in uh, a German movie. And this is what he thought it looked like. But some smaller UFOs, some four UFOs, came out of the large major UFO uh, towards him. And he kind of got scared. In any case, he launched his, tried to launch his uh, signed Wagner missiles, and the same thing happened to his instrumentation. The missiles wouldn't launch, and his communication went down. He couldn't communicate, and uh, pretty much his instruments went down. All he had was enough to, to fly the aircraft. They did not disrupt his uh, engines so he could continue flying, and he still had his controls. Now, this lieutenant name was Jafari, and he recently he was at the National Press Club, and the lieutenant, through the years, got promoted to general, and um, he had his had his story, which is some of this is coming from. But I'm not sure that he knew this, but we were being told that the UFO was on satellite. At the same time, we were picking up the UFO over Tehran on satellite. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, we pick up about uh, 50 fast walkers per month on our satellites, indicating that uh, in round numbers, 25 are entering our atmosphere and 25 are leaving our atmosphere. And these are being picked up on a regular basis. Now, McGuire is actually three bases in one, uh, which is in the center of New Jersey. Hmm. And then McGuire is on the western side, then Fort Dix, and then Lakehurst. And this area is rather interesting history to it. And uh, this is the entrance to Fort Dix. At one time, it was uh, training for the army. There's still some training going on there, and but there's a lot of uh, trucks and tanks and that kind of thing there. And here's the headquarters. Here we are at uh, Lakehurst Naval Air Station. And Lakehurst is famous for the Hindenburg. I don't know if you remember the story. But the Hindenburg is moving into um, Lakehurst and it apparently hit by lightning and destroyed in uh, May 1937. So things do happen at this, these bases. And back in... Uh, 1960, we had these Bowmark missiles, and on the these Bowmark missiles were designed to knock down 
Soviet bombers that were coming in, and they were armed with nuclear warheads. One day, one caught on fire. The uh, bombard started uh, burning, and it blew up and essentially blew up the whole site. But no nuclear weapons exploded. It was strictly the explosives on board the craft that actually are designed to set off the nuclear weapon, which went up. But this area is still pretty much off limits today. It's all fenced off and uh, they're still having trouble with radiation and so on there. Back at McGuire, uh, the UFOs were starting to be picked up this one night on January 1978. And 11 UFOs were counted in the pattern and uh, they seemed to be all disc-shaped craft and an alien was seen on the ground at Fort Dix. And uh, military policemen came upon the alien and told him to stop. The alien wouldn't stop and he fired his gun allegedly five times into the alien who was mortally wounded but took off running towards the Air Force. Base. <clears throat> any case, uh, The alien is running off and this military policeman is after him and they started uh, getting a whole group of people chasing him. They had the uh, military police on the Air Force side, they had the security police on the Army side, and the uh, state police were all after the alien, so to speak, to f find out how he, what he was doing. This aerial view that I took gives you an idea where it was happening. Oop. But this, this is McGuire here. This is the end of the runway, and the alien was actually over here in this area. And uh, the people that I was in contact with were air policemen who were over on the Air Force side, and they can see all this all the uh, searching going on over in the uh, Fort Dix area. <clears throat> and the UFOs are in the pattern and they seem to be angry about all of this. And the Sergeant Moore wrote uh, and told that uh, he had found the UFO on the end of the runway. He had announced this to the um, sergeant at the desk. And later on, he made this, this drawing of what he saw on the ground there. And uh, they sent up a perimeter guard around the alien. And almost immediately, some planes started coming in from Wright Patterson, and they carried a special group of people and they came in and took over the guarding of the alien. And he was sprayed and pictures were taken and so on. And very quickly the plane was loaded and ta taken off for uh, Wright Patterson. Well, about this time in the morning I came on the base and uh, through the National Guard area and they had a big check at the gate Normally they wave you right through, but this day they checked all your credentials. And they said there was a, an alert going on. And as I drove on base, I could see the uh, red lights out on the end of the runway. And my job was at this 21st Air Force headquarters, where again we had a command post. That was kind of the system in those days, and every morning they'd be briefings for the generals. I went in the command post and when I walked in they said an alien had been shot and was on the end of the runway and um, that a plane had come in, a C-141 which I flew was coming in from Wright Patterson to pick up the alien and the strange thing was all happening within a matter of hours or almost minutes. It's like the people at Wright Patterson knew what was happening and uh, had launched planes almost immediately. 
any case, this group came in, picked up the alien, and uh, were taking it back there. And my job was to uh, confirm the story. I called the um, military police, and they confirmed that this was going on. Talked to the radar people. Yes, the, there's UFOs in the air. And um, talked to the tower. Tower people said, yes, they could see things, that uh, something was going on, and aircraft in the air were seeing things. This gives you an idea of what the base and where the having trouble here. The alien was shot in this area here where there's a lot of vehicles and and ran across to the end of the runway and was found about this point. Now the interesting thing is that uh, there's this open area here which is all cement and we'll talk about that in a minute again with more UFOs and my job was to brief General Sadley that morning and just before I went on to brief the story about the alien being there they said don't brief it uh, we want to so many words keep it quiet again the pilots were seeing UFOs and uh, in the pattern and that morning after the my regular briefing I went over to the photo lab and the photo lab indicated that uh, they had taken pictures of something very strange and they actually handed me the envelope and uh, I went to open it and they said no he can't see that so I never actually opened the envelope to see which I assume was the aliens interestingly enough it started snowing and uh, by the next morning we had this huge pile of snow and I've never seen this before, but we had a military policeman guarding the snow. <laughs> now, part of the story that I never could confirm is that, they, that the cr uh, craft crashed or part of a craft was thrown out, uh, like a, a escape pod, and that the alien was in the escape pod. Again, I can't confirm it. All the uh, security police that had been out guarding the alien were flown to Wright-Patterson. And on the way, they were threatened that if they ever told the story, they might be thrown out of the aircraft. <clears throat> now, later on, Leonard Stringfield got the story. And uh, I found out about it, you know, from my standpoint, and I started investigating and went to the security police uh, offices and asked for any files that they had, you know, any indication that there was uh, aliens and all of that, and they, they knew nothing about it. Uh, whether they did or not, they wouldn't admit to it. I talked to some security policemen, and uh, one indicated that he had seen the aircraft and the, the UFOs in the air, but he didn't know anything about the UFO itself. And this is the area where the alien was allegedly shot. And uh, interestingly enough, they shut, shut down the road that went behind the base. Uh, and I'm told they were cleaning up areas. It, it was closed for an extended period of time, particularly at night, like something was going on for several weeks uh, in trying to clean up whatever was left over from the alien. And this is the area where he went from Fort Dix across the fence or through the fence over to McGuire. And this is the area that I mentioned that he's right near this very large paved area that's uh, a half a mile long and a quarter of a mile wide that's in the Army side of the base. And if you notice, it has large... Uh, floodlights over it. So I don't know what the Army does. It's kind of a rough field to play football on <laughs> with this large field. And if you can you see it here, right in the center of the screen, and it, it's kind of hidden through the woods to get there. Now here's where the uh, vehicles were, and there's a road that's hidden by the trees and over here, this very large landing area. Here's the 
the runway, runway where the body was found. And uh, C-141 taken from that landing area. And this is the spot where the a alien was on the base. Now, I talked to a lot of colonels and generals, and nobody seemed to know anything about it. I was one of the few that knew about it. And they retired me within like six weeks. They, um, the, the security policemen were all transferred, and the wing commander was transferred. And it seemed like anybody who knew anything about it was transferred or retired immediately. Uh, this is a gentleman that uh, I was very upset by the fact that I couldn't find out anything about the uh, alien and I stopped in this antique shop and uh, I was telling him that I was concerned that uh, I just talked to this general today and he hadn't indicated any knowledge of it and he says, well I know all about UFOs, what do you need to know? He says, I was in OSI and I was at wright Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, one night at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from a friend of mine. And he says, come over to Hangar 18. I've got something to show you. And he says, it's in the middle of the night. My wife's asleep. He says, this is worthwhile, believe me. In any case, he goes over there. He meets his friend who lets him in this, this hangar. And he's shown an alien body. Now this alien body is from the movie Hangar 18. It's not the real alien. I'm sorry I couldn't get the picture. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he's also shown the craft. Now the craft that he saw actually had a tarpaulin over it and they looked, you know, pulled the tarpaulin up so they could see a certain amount of it, but he was warned not to take too much of the tarpaulin off because it would set off alarms and would create an embarrassing situation. So I was always interested because he said it looked just like Hangar 18. Well, I happen to have a friend, Sam Sherman, who produces movies. And I said, do you know anything about Hangar 18? He says, oh yeah, that's my friend, he said, uh, who made that movie. And you know, he said, that was backed by the Air Force. And that everything in that movie, as uh, far as he was told, who made the movie, was tr true. So if you want to get uh, good inside information, you might rent that, uh, that movie. So, well, with this, I'm all excited now about going to Wright-Patterson. And about a month later, I had an opportunity to, to drive there. So I called this fellow up who was the antique dealer in Vincenttown and said, uh, well, where do they keep the UFOs when I go to Wright-Patterson? I want to see some. <laughs> so he explained to me that, uh, well, when you go on the base, you can go into the um, museum area. He says, it's not there. But it's worth seeing the museum. <laughs> he said, but from the museum, you can see pretty much where you, you want to go. There's the right uh, the monument for the Wright brothers. And he said, uh, there's a big hangar there. That's not it either. He said, you... <laughs> Diverting for just a minute, I just want to mention the fact that uh, at Wright-Patterson is a foreign technology division where whenever we capture an airplane or uh, a foreign pilot flies one away and we set him up for life, uh, we get the aircraft and we take it apart at uh, Wright-Patterson. So that's the place where everything goes, so to speak. The, the, any kind of foreign technology goes there. In any case, you go up Wright Boulevard, up, up the road there, and he said, yeah, as you go up the road, you'll find this great big propeller testing stadium. And he says, well, they tested the UFOs in there, and uh, as well as helicopters and blades and everything else, but that was a testing point. And if you can imagine, just to the left of that, uh, a few hundred feet, is this building 18F. 
everybody's heard of a Hangar 18, but uh, it's really 18F. And this isn't even a hangar. Now, the interesting thing about this building, it was built in something like a month. Now, I've never heard of anything in the government being built in a month. <laughs> But that's what they told me. This, is the, this building is the fastest built building ever made, supposedly. Any case, if you go to the back of this building, it looks like this. And this is my uh, wife's car here sitting in front of it, which is about 20 feet long. So this opening is roughly 50 feet in diameter, so that a nice-sized UFO could fit right in there. Any case, I managed to get the key and go inside, and this is what it looked like. Unfortunately, uh, I couldn't find a UFO in there. It, it had been moved. <clears throat> but I was told that this is roughly what it looked like when it was there. In any case, uh, the story is that I started checking around the base and talking to different people, and uh, it's surprising, well, being that I'm military or ex-military and interested in the subject, people will pretty much talk to you. Now this aircraft here is a laser aircraft. It's one of the first aircraft and our lasers are much better than most people realize. They apparently can uh, even shoot down uh, aircraft. And I don't know if you notice behind here there's a runway and this runway goes up a hill. And the idea was what could an aircraft take off faster if it was going uphill or testing it or if it was going downhill? Well, in any case, uh, didn't work, didn't have much advantage either way. So they built a hangar in the end of this runway. And uh, from what I told is that's where they keep the UFOs. So if you can get in that hangar in that runway, you'll find the UFOs. And that's pretty much all I learned while I was on active duty. I've been trying to keep up with the subject ever since, and uh, I'm convinced that UFOs exist. Uh, some of them are ours. Most of them are, are alien. And they're here, and they're visiting us. Um, they haven't destroyed us yet, so I guess they can be considered fairly friendly. Uh, some of the abductees don't think so, but... Uh, I do feel that the, it's important that, uh, you know, that they exist and that uh, at least a few people in the Air Force believe that. And uh, later, if you want, you can get a copy of a DVD of, of my book. And uh, of 13 years of filers, files put out on a weekly basis. And flying off his right wing is a UFO. And this UFO stayed with him for an extended period of time and started doing loops around the aircraft. <laughs> and then it flew off in high speed. Now, again, I didn't see that, but I believe what these people are telling me because it's first-hand accounts. Then I was transferred to London, England, and there I flew um, tanker aircraft. My mouth is dry. <laughs> and in the tankers, we were up every night, and the idea was that when the weather got bad, the fighters had very short time airborne, only an hour or so, and they would need to be refueled when the fog rolled in in England and they would go off to uh, Spain or Germany. Well, we were up there with 16 hours of fuel and we were told that uh, they had had bad occurrences when the uh, RAF fighters went after the uh, UFOs and that some of them didn't come back and they asked us if we would chase the UFOs instead. sure I wanted to do, but, uh, you know, what the heck. And they said that, un un that they didn't bother unarmed aircraft, which we were not armed. It was just the uh, fighters that tried to fire at them, and they'd get mad at it. <clears throat> well,
Well, in any case, uh, we're up there one night, uh, just as the sun's coming down, and London Control spotted a UFO over the center part of England. And we're flying up here. Oop. over the uh, North Sea, and the UFO is down here near Stonehenge in the center of England. So we, we're at some 33,000 feet, and the UFO is at about 1,000 feet. So we had to move from uh, the North Sea down to where they were, which would take um, oh, 20 minutes or so. But we were doing some 400 miles an hour, and we're diving down, and we looked over at the red line of the aircraft, we're going 30 miles over the speed limit, so to speak, on the aircraft. The red line means if you fly above that speed, your wings will come off, which is a bad thing. <laughs> so, so, so anyhow, we had to pull back on the power. But we look on the radar, and interestingly enough, on the radar is this huge radar return. and. Uh, if you fly over Scotland, knowledge of it, and he says, well, I know all about UFOs. What do you need to know? He says, I was in OSI, and I was at wright Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, one night at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from a friend of mine. And he says, come over to Hangar 18. I've got something to show you. And he says, it's in the middle of the night. My wife's asleep. He says, this is worthwhile, believe me. In any case, he goes over there. He meets his friend who lets him in this, this hangar. And he's shown an alien body. Now this alien body is from the movie Hangar 18. It's not the real alien. I'm sorry I couldn't get the picture. <laughs> and uh, He's also shown the craft. Now, the craft that he saw actually had a tarpaulin over it, and they looked, you know, pulled the tarpaulin up so they could see a certain amount of it, but he was warned not to t take too much of the tarpaulin off because it would set off alarms and would create an embarrassing situation. So I was always in interested because he said it looked just like Hangar 18. Well, I happen to have a friend. Sam Sherman, who produces movies. And I said, do you know anything about Hangar 18? He, he says, oh, yeah, that's my friend, he said, uh, who made that movie. And you know, he said, that was backed by the Air Force. And that everything in that movie, as uh, far as he was told, who made the movie, was tr true. So if you want to get uh, good inside information, you might rent that, uh, that movie. So well, with this, I'm all excited now about going to Wright-Patterson. And about a month later, I had an opportunity to, to drive there. So I called this fellow up who was the antique dealer in Vincenttown and said, uh, well, where do they keep the UFOs when I go to Wright-Patterson? I want to see some. <laughs> so he explained to me that, uh, well, when you go on the base, you can go into the um, museum area. He says, it's not there. But it's worth seeing the museum. <laughs> he said, but from the museum, you can see pretty much where you, you want to go. There's the Wright, uh, the monument for the Wright brothers. And he said, uh, there's a big hangar there. That's not it either. He said, you... <laughs> Diverting for just a minute, I just want to mention the fact that uh, at Wright-Patterson is the Foreign Technology Division where whenever we capture an airplane or uh, interesting history to it, and uh, this is the entrance to Fort Dix, and at one time it was uh, training for the Army. There's still some training going on there, and but there's a lot of uh, trucks and tanks and that kind of thing there. And here's the headquarters. Here we are at uh, Lakehurst Naval Air Station. And Lakehurst is famous for the Hindenburg. I don't know if you remember the story. But the Hindenburg is moving into um, Lakehurst and a, apparently hit by lightning and destroyed in uh, May 1937. So 
things do happen at these, these bases. And back in uh, 1960, we had these Bowmark missiles. And on the, these Bowmark missiles were designed to knock down Soviet bombers that were coming in. And they were armed with nuclear warheads. One day, one caught on fire. The uh, Bowmark started uh, burning, and it blew up and essentially blew up the whole site. But no nuclear weapons exploded. It was strictly the explosives on board the craft that actually are designed to set off the nuclear weapon, which went up. But this area is still pretty much off limits today. It's all fenced off, and they're still having trouble with radiation and so on there. Back at McGuire, uh, the UFOs were starting to be picked up this one night on January 1978. And 11 UFOs were counted in the pattern, and uh, they seemed to be all disc-shaped craft, and an alien was seen on the ground at Fort Dix. And uh, military policemen came upon the alien and told him to stop. The alien wouldn't stop, and he fired his gun allegedly five times into the alien, who was mortally wounded, but took off running towards the Air Force. Base. <clears throat> any case, uh, the alien is running off, and this military policeman is after him, and they started uh, getting a whole group of people chasing him. They had the uh, military police on the Air Force side. They had the security police on the Army side. And the uh, state police were all after the alien, so to speak, to f find out how he, what he was doing. This, and uh, I think that, in fact, is the case, that uh, aliens are there. We have indications that they're doing mining there and probably use that as a base to uh, come here. Triangle-shaped object here and uh, possible other object up on this point. And this slide is rather interesting in that uh, this is one of the early slides taken before our astronauts actually got there, but they indicate some kind of a, a base or, or a UFO of some kind. Now, when you're in Tactical Air Command, you're also part of the Navy. That sounds funny. But um, we're the Air Force part of the Atlantic Fleet. And consequently, I periodically would have to go over to Norfolk, Virginia, and work for Admiral Moore, who eventually gave me a letter of accommodation. But one day, we're playing an exercise in the command post, and there's like 50 people in the command post, and they say, everybody out of the command post except for the media presenter and the uh, commander of the command post, who was a captain. And with that, everybody leaves, and Admiral Moore comes in. So there's only three people in the command post, that normally have 50 people. And after about uh, an hour or so, he came back out and he left. We went back in and I said to the media guy that I knew pretty well because I briefed periodically with him, you know, what was going on. And he said that they had uh, reports of a UFO over uh, the Atlantic Ocean and that the carriers were launching aircraft to pick them up. And they thought that the UFO had come out of the ocean and was flying, you know, over the Atlantic and they were trying to pick it up. Well, they launched fighters to um, find the UFO and get uh, gun camera film of it. And uh, some F-4s were launched. And according to him, they had sent the gun camera film to the command post, which he he had shown to Admiral Moore. 
He said the interesting thing about it is when Admiral Moore came in the command post, he said, is this a Russian operation with us or are we doing this alone? And this is 1966. And they said, no, it was uh, just our own. And we had uh, been chasing to speak to f find out how he, what he was doing. This aerial view that I took gives you an idea where it was happening. Oop. But this, this is McGuire here. This is the end of the runway, and the alien was actually over here in this area. And uh, the people that I was in contact with were air policemen who were over on the Air Force side, and they can see all this, all the uh, searching going on over in the uh, Fort Dix area. <clears throat> and the UFOs are in the pattern, and they seem to be angry about all of this. And the Sergeant Moore wrote uh, and told that uh, he had found the UFO on the end of the runway. He had announced this to the um, sergeant at the desk. And later on, he made this, this drawing of what he saw on the ground there. And uh, they sent up a perimeter guard around the alien. And almost immediately, some planes started coming in from Wright Patterson, and they carried a special group of people. And they came in and took over the guarding of the alien. And he was sprayed, and pictures were taken, and so on. And very quickly, the plane was loaded and ta taken off for uh, Wright Patterson. Well, about this time in the morning, I came on the base and uh, through the National Guard area. And they had a big check at the gate. Normally, they wave you right through, but this day, they checked all your credentials. And they said there was a an alert going on. And as I drove on base, I could see the uh, red lights on on the end of the runway. And my job was at this 21st Air Force headquarters, where again, we had a command post. That was kind of the system in those days. And every morning, they'd be briefings for the generals. I went in the command post. And when I walked in, they said an alien had been shot and was on the end of the runway. And um, the plane had come in, a C-141, which I flew, was coming in from Wright Patterson to pick up the alien. And the strange thing was all happening within a matter of hours or almost minutes. It's like the people at Wright Patterson knew what was happening and uh, had launched planes almost immediately for navigation training. And uh, here I am in front of an aircraft. And while I was there, I was asked to be a courier and take secret classified messages over to um, 12th Air Force headquarters from James Connolly Air Force Base. And when I arrived there, there was an officer there that I gave the uh, classified messages to. And I said, what do you do, uh, sir? And he says, oh, my job is to... Uh, schedule UFOs into Gray Army Air Force Base. And they pick up cargo and so on and take them away. And I didn't think to ask him whether it was our UFOs or alien UFOs, but uh, very early I heard that there was UFOs in the Air Force. And they were at Gray Air Force, Army Air Force Base. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, there's some secret hangars there, at least I was told that, and that these craft would land and be moved into the hangars. And at the same time, large amounts of uh, cargo would come in on trucks. And the strange thing is that these trucks would come on and they would uh, not come out of the base. People would see you know, hundreds of trucks go on the base and nothing come out. I'm not sure what that meant, but it was kind of strange. 
James Connolly allegedly had uh, discs flying out of it. That was the word that we were told. I did not see any discs. This happens to be uh, Michael Schratz's uh, pictures of discs that were at uh, James Connolly or, and other bases. When I graduated from uh, flight, transferred to Athens, Greece. And uh, here we're going into Athens and seeing the Acropolis and the Parthenon. And the fellow that was in the office next to me was a pilot who had come from Korea. And he flew B-25s over Korea. And he said he was flying there one day on a bombing mission. And flying off his right wing is a UFO. And this UFO stayed with them for an extended period of time and started doing loops around the aircraft. <laughs> and then it flew off in high speed. Now, again, I didn't see that, but I believe what these people are telling me because it's first-hand accounts. Then I was transferred to London, England. That I gave the uh, classified messages to and I said, what do you do, uh, sir? He says, oh, my job is to uh, schedule UFOs into Gray Army Air Force Base. And they pick up cargo and so on and take them away. And I didn't think to ask him whether it was our UFOs or alien UFOs, but uh, very early I heard that there was UFOs in the Air Force. And they were at Gray Air Force Base. Army Air Force Base, and the interesting thing about that is that uh, there's some secret hangars there, at least I was told that, and that these craft would land and be moved into the hangars, and at the same time, large amounts of uh, cargo would come in on trucks. And the strange thing is that these trucks would come on and they would uh, not come out of the base. People would see, you know, hundreds of trucks go on the base and nothing come out. I'm not sure what that meant, but it was kind of strange. James Connolly allegedly had uh, discs flying out of it. That was the word that we were told. I did not see any discs. This happens to be uh, Michael Schratz's uh, pictures of discs that were at uh, James Conley or, and other bases. When I graduated from uh, flight, transferred to Athens, Greece. And uh, here we're going into Athens and seeing the Acropolis and the Parthenon. And the fellow that was in the office next to me was a pilot who had come from Korea. And he flew B-25s over Korea and he said he was flying there one day on a bombing mission, and flying off his right wing is a UFO. And this UFO stayed with him for an extended period of time and started doing loops around the aircraft. <laughs> and then it flew off in high speed. Now, again, I didn't see that, but I believe what these people are telling me because it's first-hand accounts. Then I was transferred to London, England, and there I flew um, tanker aircraft. My mouth is dry. <laughs> and in the tankers, we were up every night, and the idea was that when the weather got bad, the fighters had very short time airborne, only an hour or so, and they would need for our astronauts actually got there, but they indicate some kind of a, a base or, or a UFO of some kind. Now, <laughs> when you're in tactical air command, you're also part of the Navy. That sounds funny, but um, we're the Air Force part of the Atlantic Fleet, and consequently, I, periodically would have to go over to Norfolk, Virginia and work for Admiral Moore, who eventually gave me a letter of accommodation. But one day 
we're playing an exercise in the command post and there's like 50 people in the command post and they say everybody out of the command post except for the media presenter and the uh, commander of the command post who was a captain and with that everybody leaves and Admiral Moore comes in so there's only three people in the command post that normally have 50 people and after about uh, an hour or so he came back out and he left we went back in and I said to the media guy that I knew pretty well because I briefed periodically with him you know what was going on and he said that they had uh, reports of a UFO over uh, the Atlantic Ocean and that the carriers were launching aircraft to pick them up and they thought that the UFO had come out of the ocean and was flying you know over the Atlantic and they were trying to pick it up well, they launched fighters to um, find the UFO <clears throat> and get uh, gun camera film of it and uh, some F4s were launched and according to him they had sent the gun camera film to the command post which he he had shown to Admiral Moore and he said the interesting thing about it is when Admiral Moore came in the command post he said is this a Russian operation with us or are we doing this alone and this is 1966 and they said no it was uh, just our own and we had uh, been chasing them again we didn't really catch him but we got some good uh, video of it in 1968 I was sent to Vietnam and um, again my job was a, a briefer there in intelligence at 7th Air Force headquarters and I worked for um, General Brown who has his biography and in the biography he says they weren't called UFOs they were called enemy helicopters Along the way, I met a German scientist, which is kind of strange in a way, but um, it happened that a good friend of mine happened to be German, and his father had come from Germany, and we took a trip to Florida together, and he met this scientist, and this scientist claimed that he had seen a UFO. As a matter of fact, four of the scientists were at... Uh, White Sands Proving Ground and they were walking up a ridge and just as they got to the top of the ridge and just their heads came over the top of the ridge they saw this UFO down in this valley and there's five little aliens that were picking up rocks now it sounds funny but I didn't particularly believe the story at the time. but we were with this uh, German scientist for two weeks and he kept on repeating the story and he told that he went back to headquarters and the five the scientists told the White Sands colonel that they'd seen this UFO and he said no you didn't uh, you just forget about it so that was one of the first experiences that I had I went to James Connolly Air Force Base for navigation training and uh, here I am in front of an aircraft and while I was there I was asked to be a courier and take secret classified messages over to um, 12th Air Force headquarters from James Connolly Air Force Base And when I arrived there there was an officer there that I gave the uh, classified messages to and I said what do you do uh, sir and he says oh my job is to uh, schedule UFOs into Gray Army Air Force Base and they pick up cargo and so on and take them away and I didn't think to ask him whether it was our UFOs or alien UFOs but uh, very early I heard that there was UFOs in the Air Force and they were at Gray Air Force Army Air Force Base and the interesting thing about that is that uh, there's some secret hangars there at least I was told that and that these craft would land and be moved into the hangars and at the same time large amounts of uh, cargo would come in on trucks 
And the strange thing is that these trucks would come on and they would uh, not come out of the base. People would see, you know, hundreds of trucks go on the base and nothing come out. I'm not sure what that meant, but it was kind of strange. I briefed him about them, and I don't remember calling them helicopters, but uh, I think we just called them unidentified aircraft. But UFOs were seen on a fairly regular basis in Vietnam. Uh, they seemed to come and enjoy watching the war, so to speak. <laughs> you know, we're kind of, we, a lot of us don't think about it, but we're, you know, kind of warlike. We uh, seem to be in war all the time. There's a couple going on right now, you know. <laughs> Any case, uh, this photograph happened to be given to me by a, a Navy commander, uh, Bethune, but it's rather interesting picture that he had gotten close up. After a year in Vietnam, I came back to uh, Scott Air Force Base, and uh, which is in Illinois, and again I was a briefer. And I briefed on a regular basis in intelligence every morning, which is not the greatest thing. You have to come in early in the morning, like four or five o'clock in the morning, and prepare your briefing for the generally at eight o'clock, and. Uh, you go in the command post and they have uh, four or five s slides. We only have two here, but there you have uh, five. And, you, and they like you to keep the screens filled with, uh, with slides. So <clears throat> I went down to the Washington, D.C. and the Pentagon, and there's a, a section off the Pentagon where they have literally a room this big full of slides and pictures and movies and, and everything you could ever want for video. <clears throat> well, in any case, I went in there and I got about a thousand slides and many of these are, you know, secret and top secret slides, you know, of Soviet aircraft, there's SAM missiles and uh, things that they, again, they don't let the public see. But I mentioned to the fellow behind the counter after I got like a thousand slides, I said, you know, about once a month I brief uh, a UFO sighting, pretty much like uh, I'm doing now. <laughs> In any case, uh, I need some pictures of UFOs. The fellow says, we got a whole vault full of UFO pictures and gun camera film, but you can't have them. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I'm the general's briefer. General Canton sent me to get slides and so on, and you just gave me thousand slides, many of which were top secret and stuff. He said, you can't have any. <laughs> he said, they're in a vault, the vault is guarded, and you need written authorization from a four-star general unified commander with a need to know to get those pickling. <clears throat> uh, after we moved away, I joined the uh, the Air Force and learned to fly through, flew T-33s and uh, along the way I met a German scientist which is kind of strange in a way but um, it happened that a good friend of mine happened to be German and his father had come from Germany and we took a trip to Florida together and he met this scientist and this scientist claimed that he had seen a UFO. As a matter of fact, four of the scientists were at uh, White Sands Proving Ground and they were walking up a ridge and just as they got to the top of the ridge and just their heads came over the top of the ridge, they saw this UFO down in this valley. And there's five little aliens that were picking up rocks. Now it sounds funny, but I didn't particularly believe the story at the time. But we were with this uh, German scientist for two weeks and he kept on repeating the story. And he told that he went back to headquarters and the five the scientists told the White Sands colonel that they'd seen this UFO and he said, no you didn't, uh, you just forget about it. So that was one of the first experiences that I had went to James Connolly Air Force Base for navigation training and uh, here I am in front of an aircraft 
And while I was there, I was asked to be a courier and take secret classified messages over to um, 12th Air Force headquarters from James Connolly Air Force Base. And when I arrived there, there was an officer there that I gave the uh, classified messages to. And I said, what do you do, uh, sir? He says, oh, my job is to uh, schedule UFOs into Gray Army Air Force Base. And they pick up cargo and so on and take them away. And I didn't think to ask him whether it was our UFOs or alien UFOs, but uh, very early I heard that there was UFOs in the Air Force. And they were at Gray Air Force, Army Air Force Base, and the interesting thing about that is that uh, there's some secret hangars there, at least I was told that, and that these craft would land and be moved into the hangars. And at the same time, large amounts of uh, cargo would come in on trucks. And the strange thing is that these trucks would come on and they would 